Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this panel of esteemed Chief Information Security Officers and Leaders. The title for this session, Managing Things and Leading People in Information Security, comes from a quote from the late Admiral Grace Hopper, where she very simply but eloquently said, you manage things, you lead people. We are here today to talk about what it takes to lead in good times and in bad times, as well as getting insight from our panel on how you can develop into a leader as well. To illustrate the point of leadership, I will be using quotes about this topic as a way for us to engage with this discussion. Let me first begin by introducing our esteemed panel of CISOs and leaders. First, we have Ann S. Johnson, Corporate Vice President of Security, Compliance, and Identity Business Development at Microsoft. Hello, Ann. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, we are expecting to have Wendy Nather, uh, head, of advisory, head of Advisory Chief Information Security Officers at Cisco. Hopefully she will be joining us. Uh, next, we have Rinky Sethi, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Twitter. Hi, Rinky. Hi. Hi, Tracy. Hi, everyone. And batting cleanup for us is uh, Lena Smart, Chief Information Security Officer at MongoDB. Hi there. And, hi, hello, Lena. Hi. Uh, and I am your moderator, Tracy Z. Mayleaf. I am a security researcher at the Krebs Stamos Group. So why don't we dig in? We have a lot of questions and a lot of great discussion we can have. So let's start with the first question. John Maxwell said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. In the information security industry and community, a common trope is that of the quote unquote non-technical CISO. Now, has that gone the way of the dodo bird, a CISO who hasn't worked their way up through the technical ranks? Are there viable pros or cons to having a technical versus a non-technical CISO? I'm going to throw this first question over to Anne. Anne, would you like to field that? Yeah, I think that um, I think that when you think about CISOs, they come from a lot of different backgrounds, and I do think there's there's benefit to understanding the technology. But the most important thing is understanding how the technology maps to an organization's business needs, because at the end of the day, security needs to be an enabler for business, not an inhibitor, and working side by side with the business peers, understanding their objectives, making sure you maintain regulatory compliance and privacy and those types of things um, is equally important to the technical aptitude, but you do need to understand the technology at a high level, but to the extent that it maps to the business needs, right? I, I don't think that, I still meet a, a tremendous amount of CISOs around the globe that come from all different backgrounds. Some are deeply technical, some came from the business, Side, some came from the policy side, they are all equally effective. So I don't think there's a one size fits all, but I think it's increasingly important that the CISOs are able to really communicate effectively with their business peers. That's a great answer, Anne, thank you. I wanna uh, send this over to Lena. Lena, you work for MongoDB. So from your perspective, uh, talk to us about your thoughts about a technical versus non-technical CISO. So, I mean, most of the CISOs I've met have worked their way up. So, you know, I, I think what Anne says resonates very deeply as well. Um, it's great if you're super technical and you know crypto and you can decode 50,000 lines of code and see the bad line there. But if you can't talk to the board and you can't talk to your team, you can't manage, you know, what's that really worth? Um, and so I think, I, I don't think the that's gone the way of the dodo bird, uh, but I do think that we're seeing... I'm definitely seeing anyway more CISOs who've got that kind of hybrid. They're technical up to a point. They can earn the respect of their peers and their team, but they can also dazzle the board, you know, and they have enough business acumen to get the get the job done and communicate clearly as to what they want done and you know why they need budget. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, and I realized we never agreed upon a correct pronunciation of CISO. So you're gonna hear all kinds of different pronunciations. <laughs> Uh, Rinky, bring us home. What do you? What are your thoughts and perspective on this technical versus non-technical CISOs? Yeah, I, I think my like my peers here described it perfectly. Uh, but I I do think um, it depends on the company and it depends on the role. And the CISO role still has 
so many definitions to it. Many times a startup company, you'll see a CISO is one person and they're expected to be highly technical. They're architecting solutions. They're deeply embedded with engineering. And you look at larger companies or banks where the CISO is more risk focused, has to understand the business. And so you see kind of a range of CISOs out there. Um, I do think um, the most important thing, technical or non-technical, and I think both um, make really good CISOs, is that the ability to learn quickly, understand the business needs, as Anne said, and then uh, be able to translate like very, I mean, some of the biggest challenges we deal with are in the information security space and to then take these complex issues, translate them into business requirements and have your, um, you know, all the stakeholders in the company understand risk at uh, a level that they're then able to make really good decisions to accelerate the business. And I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Fantastic. All great answers. Remember a couple of years ago, all everybody was up in arms that there was a music major who was a CISO for Experian. I can't wait for a couple of years when people freak out that a library science and history major like myself. <laughs> is in charge in something. Wonderful, those were all great answers, panel, thank you. Let's move on to question two. According to Publia Cyrus, anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. Within the boundaries of what you're permitted to discuss, can you speak to a time or times when you were in charge when something went terribly wrong? What leadership tactics did you employ? How do you best manage and organize the human factor, the people, while in the white hot heat of a security incident? And this might be unfair, but I'm sorry, Rinky, I'm going to go to you first, <laughs> no. since, since some, if you're allowed to. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you say that, so many incidents pop up in my head, and like my heart starts beating really fast <laughs> again, and I remember how I felt, and um, I remember the first thing I I've done is taken a deep breath to really like calm down my heart rate. Um, because the last thing you want to do as a leader um, is start running around with your head cut off and, you know, freaking everybody out. It's all about maintaining calm, understanding the facts, what's going on, being able to communicate with the executive and executive team, um, and then setting boundaries so the team can go and investigate, contain. Um, and so I think those are the most important things is staying calm, ensuring prior to an incident that you've had, uh, hopefully have a crisis management play, uh, plan in place so you have the buy-in that you need. Um, and then I remember working on an incident um, in one of my prior companies that lasted, gosh, I think it was very heated for almost three or four weeks and teams were working around the clock. Um, and I, you know, at that point, I don't know what hat I was wearing, whether it was a mom hat or taking orders for food or whatever the team needed, but I was in there with them in the room every single day. Anytime there was a body in there, I was there with them. And I think um, showing that that in the deep care that you have for the team, taking care of them, making sure that they have what, they're need, what they need um, and that their mental state is good because they're, they, uh, you know, incident responders, they're in the trenches and they want to do everything to make sure that the company comes out of this in a good position and they will not sleep or eat or do anything that they need to do. And so I think watching out for them in that way is very, very important as well. So um, yeah, staying calm, taking care of the team, um, keeping your executives updated, um, but making sure that the team is able to then go and do their work um, in a healthy way. And I'm not sure if this is a fair question or not, but I'm just curious, because it's Twitter, do you feel extra pressure when there's a, an incident or does, does it feel any more, I don't know if you can compare it to a past experience and not that any company is not significant, but I'm just curious, because it's Twitter, does that feel even more crushing? Hey, Wendy. Yeah, hey, I, um, <laughs> glad, glad you were able to make it. Yeah, I think um, at Twitter, one of the things is that an incident is, the, the one big difference I've seen, and I'll talk about a few nuances, but the one big difference I've seen is that when there's an incident, there's a lot more people involved because the incidents aren't just, they're never just a security incident. There's so much more to it. And everything that happens on Twitter is talked about on Twitter. So it's already public generally. And so there's that aspect of it. And so you're caring for a larger group of people. You're managing a larger group of people. There's a lot more noise. The chaos you see on Twitter externally is a lot of times internal chaos as well. Um, and that's how we operate. So it's a lot harder to manage. Um, I will also say that COVID made it, I think, 
in some ways easier for teams to collaborate and have a kind of a level playing field experience, but also made it much harder for me to check in with folks or when I need information, if folks are in a war room and they're in the heat of it, I can't just walk up to somebody. It's like you're waiting for them to respond to Slack messages. I also checking in has to be is much bigger of an effort because you have to go and really spend time with that individual. You're not observing your team and how they might be feeling or doing. So that made it a lot harder. Um, and again, I, I think that's not Twitter specific. I just happened to move to Twitter during the COVID situation. So those are kind of the nuances that I've observed here. Sure. Thank you. That, thank you for that perspective. That's great. And is there anything you're able to share with us with the, with this question? Yeah. You know what I will share because I was there would be um, the RSA breach, which was mm. 10 years ago. So I, I feel I feel I can talk about that. Here's here's what I would say. Um, and, and Rinky said it. Have a plan. Have a breach recovery plan that you've tested. You've communicated. Everyone knows what the plan is. Stay calm. Work the plan rely on your instincts, check in with the team, keep the executives up to date. And as Rinky said, when you're doing an event, it's more than just technical, right? You have legal concerns, you have public relations concerns, you have board concerns, you may have regulatory concerns. All of that needs to be in the plan. So when you do hit this crisis, you're not in crisis mode, you're just working the plan that you've already developed and tested. But the most important thing you can do as a leader is show confidence, even if you have to fake it, right? Show confidence, be calm, be there leading from the front for your team and just follow your instincts. You got this, right? You got this, you've got a plan, you know what the plan is. You're also, you know, hyper intelligent person who's worked through these types of things and you just have to trust that you know that you can lead your team through this event, even if you're quietly breaking down or save your break, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll schedule my breakdown for when this is over. You know, also <laughs> put that on the schedule for later. We just need to get through this right now. So that's what I would say. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, Lena, why don't you bring us home for Q2 and tell us uh, about any white hot spotlights you've been under and how you how you <laughs> how you were uh, at the helm. So I, I can't talk about a specific incident, but what, what I try and think of is like I'm the captain of the plane that's thirty thousand feet above the Atlantic Ocean, and the engines have just cut. And you know, you just have to be as, as everyone has said, just remain as calm as possible. And you know, when we do tabletop exercises, we make it clear that it's a safe space. You can shout and scream and vent and blame people all you like, as long as at the end of it we work out this is your role. This is what will happen if the inevitable hits the fan. And, you know, they've got it kind of out of their system, hopefully, um, that, you know, we've gone through the worst thing that could possibly happen. So hopefully when something does hit the fan, it's not that bad. They know how to deal with it. And there's a playbook for it. You know, go look here. This is where you'll find what you have to do next. So, yep, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'd like to give a welcome to Wendy Nather. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> so, hi. Uh, we're Thanks, gonna... everybody. <laughs> I, I am that CISO who shows up late to meetings and then apologizes and dashes out in the middle of the meeting because <laughs> there's something else on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you're just in time for question three, so I'm going to have you take that first, but let me read it for everyone. Uh, question three. Staying with the idea of things going wrong, Miley Carnegie said, the only real negative that can happen when you fail is if you haven't learned from it. So Wendy, can you start us off? Can you share examples of lessons you have learned along the way in your career progression? And how has that shaped you as a leader? Oh, boy. Um, y you know, I, I, I'm actually going to argue with this saying right here because depending on what kind of environment you're in and depending on whether you're an underrepresented person, there are people who are waiting for you to fail and they are waiting to point it out. And unfortunately we have, um, you know, part of the, the culture of InfoSec as, as an industry is that there are people who specialize in going, Ooh, you missed a spot or, you know, how could you let that happen? You know, I can't believe you didn't, X, Y, Z. And those are usually the people who have never sat in this seat and don't understand how these sorts of things happen. So uh, there are lots of negatives that can happen when you fail. Uh, I find that the, the biggest failures that I regret the most and have tried to learn from the most were um, in handling people. 
Um, sure, there are lots of technical mistakes that you can make. There are things that you don't have in place or you chose to prioritize things in the wrong order and everything. But when you're dealing with somebody's life and their livelihood, I find that that is just, you know, the most important thing as a leader. So I try uh, as I get older not to sweat the technical stuff and to some extent the political stuff. Uh, but I do care very much about my people and I keep trying to learn how to do better in, in uh, you know, being a good coworker and supporter to them. That's a great answer. Thank you. And yes, all of all of our panels, please feel free to uh, uh, dispute the quote. <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. It was just meant as a uh, discussion point. So uh, let's go over to Rinky. Rinky, uh, what what have you learned? What, what some things have you learned about being in, in a leadership role? Oh my gosh, I'm learning all the time um, and failing all the time and learning from my mistakes. Um, the the one that sticks out to me that was a really early lesson, but I'm glad that it happened um, was when I was at eBay and this was a long time back, but it was at a time where spear phishing was at a rise and eBay was seeing kind of the first early attacks um, around spear phishing in the e-retail e space. And um, they had asked, they wanted to be really bold and try something new called phishing testing, which now is, we know is a very regular thing, but back then was unheard of. And when you talk to peers, nobody was doing it. Banks were doing it and that was about it. So it was early for an e-commerce site. And I ran a small pilot with maybe about, gosh, 10 people from the security team. I had informed many people that we were going to do this pilot Somebody, we ran the pilot and it wasn't anything offensive, but someone was having a bad day, clicked on the link, got a, a training message that, hey, you, this was a phishing link. This is how, what you shouldn't do and what you should be aware of. They reported it to the head of HR. And uh, one of eBay's values at the time was um, assume people are basically good or something like that. And I got lecture that if you ever do this again, you will be fired. You will not have a job at this company. This was unacceptable. This was assuming that people aren't good or people don't know what they're doing. And so my lesson learned there, I, I've rolled out phishing testing again and again after that. But my big lesson learned was as a security person, you have to communicate really, really well, let people know what's going on. I also learned on the phishing testing front that People might be having a bad day and you have to make the messages kind of fun. You have to warn people that this is coming. You can't just have it come out in secret. And so that communication learning for me, like is something that stuck with me. And I've always leaned on uh, the side of over communicating. And I've actually that skill has been very useful as a CISO because we're constantly doing that as communicating, educating. And so, um, you know, and along the way, I think that was the biggest one that always has stuck with me that have I communicated with everybody that needs to know. Um, it's a huge lesson learned, but something that still sticks with me today. That is an incredible lesson learned. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, let's go over to Lena. Lena, as, what's what's something that you've learned? How did it shape you as a leader? So I quite enjoyed this question, although I did get really bad flashbacks to what had happened. <laughs> so, um, so many years ago, um, I got thrown out of the girl guides. I don't know if you have them over here. It's kind of like oh, scouts uh, for girls. Yeah, girl, right, girl, uh, girl scouts. Yep. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anonymous, uh, you know, reward of getting thrown out of them for fighting. But that's a story for another day. But they did teach me to be prepared. That was one of their things was be prepared. Um, and so obviously didn't learn very much from that though. So very early on in my career, maybe 20 or 21, um, I was asked to do a presentation to a customer. What is a computer? So this is when pe people were just replacing typewriters with computers. And I just thought I knew everything. I thought I was the big I am. I had a computer at home that I'd saved up for four years to buy. And I just thought I was, I was like an expert at this. <laughs> I obviously wasn't. So I didn't even bother to prepare anything. I thought I'll just go and talk to these people. And the majority of the attendees were just glad to be at the office getting some free food and a cup of tea. But there was one guy who just thought he knew everything and he proceeded to make my life miserable for the longest 60 minutes of my life. And then he wrote a horrible letter to my boss saying she doesn't know anything, we're not paying for this, this was awful. You know, the cake and the tea was lovely, but she was terrible. And my boss took me into a room and I, I was just crying. I was like almost hysterical at this point. And he didn't fire me. You know, I wasn't going to get fired for it. But 
I, I mean, it's seared into my brain. I can feel the shame of that day. I mean, looking back, it's a tiny thing, but I was, you know, I was like 21. I thought I knew everything. I was like his top performer and I just got my legs shot from under me that day. And I've now just been super prepared for adventure. I've got like five pages of notes just for this, this panel, <laughs> just so I can answer every question 12 different ways. Um, because it's also respectful, you know, but that, that was just a huge, that was a huge learning curve for me it was like, you don't know everything and you do actually have to put time into this if you want to be taken seriously. So that was my response. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'd like to uh, add a note to the Diana Initiative organizers to please book Lena as the keynote for next year so oh. she can talk to us about getting kicked out of the Girl Guides. Oh, <laughs> terrible. You know what? I'll probably get put in prison for it. <laughs> Nobody died. Nobody died. I also think there's a special dynamic of being a Scottish CISO. I think there's just like a, a good handbook and lessons to be learned. <laughs> from all well, I can tell you a lot of stories when I worked in a shipyard, but again, that's what I'm oh, doing. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. We, you need to keynote and just do an open talk with you. Uh, and and what, what uh, youth groups did you almost get kicked out of? Can you, <laughs> you know, my mother wouldn't let me join the Girl Scouts, um, but that's a whole other story. Um, but um, the uh, here, here's what I'll tell you. And I'm going to go back to, and because I, I think it, 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 it's something that I carry with me today, which is why I'm going to go back. My, um, I'm one of those people whose mind is always like racing and there's always something going on. So at times I have difficulty staying present. And to Lena's point, that's a sign of respect when you're with people, right? You're meeting with somebody, you actually need to be present in the meeting and engage and actively listening and participating and not just checking the box that you, that you did it. And I remember um, the first time this happened to me, I was in my early twenties also, and I had a customer meeting and um, they had, I was living in Southern California in the foothills and they had announced there was a fire and um, that was in, you know, in the foothills. And, and I didn't know how, you know, back then, you know, we didn't have social media. I couldn't go, there was no instantaneously checking, right? I'm listening to the radio as I'm driving to this meeting and thinking, okay, my dogs are home. My partner is pretty far away. I'm closer. Um, but I still went to the meeting and, um, but my mind wasn't present. I wasn't there, right? I wasn't mentally there. because I was thinking, okay, how long is it going to take me to get home? I've got to make sure the dogs are okay. I don't know where this fire is. It could be close. And, to Lita's point, the woman you know, that I met with, this this um, this buyer, you know, sent it out to my boss and said, "Look, you know, I don't know what this woman was doing, but she certainly wasn't here, and it's one of the worst meetings I ever had. A complete waste of my time." And it was like my first lesson in, you know, in reality, I should have canceled the meeting. I should have rescheduled it because I that it was a situation where I wasn't going to be present. But it was also something I still have to remember today, which is to give what I'm doing my full time and attention and a lot. You know, my my team will joke, you know, they they'll say the, the, the joke is squirrel. We lost her, you know, like a squirrel flew by the window. <laughs> and I really try to minimize those moments and really because it is it's disrespectful to other people to not be present when they're when they're spending a lot of time and effort. Right. You know, to, to prepare for a meeting and you're just, you know, mentally not there. So it's something that I continually learn. That that's a really great point that I wasn't even expecting to come out of this answer. So so thank you, Lena and Anne, for for that. That's really great. All right, for those of you playing the home game, we're moving on to question four. So question four: Too many people have been attributed to the statement about talking to the C-suite. Uh, that statement that goes: "Be brief, be bold, and be gone." You may have heard it as be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. As CISOs, can you explain from your point of view how you wish people communicated with you or share some strategies of how to best make an impact and be heard up the chain of command? What guidance or advice would you give folks trying to communicate to skip levels? And uh, why don't we kick that off with Wendy? Uh, I was going to suggest, you know, like hand puppets uh, <laughs> or, or, you know, anything that, that you know, gets people's attention. Um, yeah, I, I think the best thing that has worked for me is, and it sounds cliche, but really trying to find out in advance what it is they want to know. And uh, especially if it comes down to risk discussions, I find that the biggest gap between the CISO and the C-suite is the agreement on how probable a given risk is 
for happening. They might say, yes, you're right. The impact we agree on, you know, if this happens, we'll lose $11 billion in federal funding, but we don't think that's going to happen. So trying to have that discussion with them about how, you know, how likely do you think it is and walking through it with them in in their language you know if they give you the answer they're more likely to believe in it than if you give them the answer so i find that you know the top level of the fair model for example is great for just throwing up you know one slide and going okay let's talk this through how many mitniks do you think it would take to you know break into this you think five i think two okay you know let, let, let's do this um so it, it really is important to be able to give them the information that they want, not necessarily the things that are interesting to you. And you always have to remember that you are just a very small part of the things that they're concerned with all the time, whether it's right or it's wrong. Um, you know, security is not the main thing in their life. You know, if, if you are a firefighter and you're running around putting out fires all day, you feel like the whole world is on fire. The rest of the people, not so much. So that's uh, that's all the wisdom I have for this, really, <laughs> other than hand puppets. Mm -hmm. Well, that that alone is worth the price of admission. So yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, Anne, why don't you talk to us about some communication strategies? How how do people may at Microsoft, you know, communicate with <laughs> upper levels, or or if you don't want to use that as an example? <laughs> oh, I can use that as an example. I, I think the most important thing I would say is know your audience. Every company culture is different and every person you're communicating with is, is, is actually different. And at Microsoft, you know, it may shock you that as the creators of Excel, we can find a data point for anything. So um, Microsoft is extremely data driven. That's not a pejorative statement, it just is what it is. So depending on who at Microsoft you're meeting with, you may need to go with that really dense deck of a lot of data to deliver your point. However, I am a big believer in be brief, be brilliant, and be gone, just so you know. Um, and no matter who you're communicating with, don't bury the lead, right? Start with, you need to storytell. Even if you're going to have a lot of data, you need to storytell. What story is that data telling you? What are the, th I always say, what are the three things you want the audience to leave the meeting with? Three things. That, and that's what I say to my team. What are the three things, whether it's a written document, a PowerPoint, or an oral presentation, what are the three things you want the audience to leave with? And you need to know that yourself, by the way. Sometimes we get so deep in the data, or like um, you know, Wendy said, firefighting, that we forget. We don't, we're not focusing on what's important. So if you can focus on three things, start every conversation with that in mind. If it's a really data-driven organization, make sure your data supports those three things and then get those outcomes. That's how I try to drive every meeting at any level because it also helps an executive who's super busy, focused on a million things, if they know exactly what your expectations of them are coming out of the meeting. Here's what I want to get from this meeting. And as I said, don't bury the lead, start there, right? Start with here's, you know, and then, Reinf I typically will start a meeting, and this is because I did spend a lot of years in sales, as many of you know, with here is what here are the objectives of the meeting. Are you aligned to these objectives? Because let's start there. And then that sets the table. And it doesn't matter who you're meeting with. It's a really effective strategy. That's fantastic. So I, um, just kind of in summary, I guess you're, you're also kind of talking about that bluff, B-L-U-F, uh, bottom line up front or the inverted pyramid, just for also for our audience of put, stacking the uh, the details and the crucial stuff up top is what it sounds like you're saying. Yeah, anybody who knows me knows that that's, if you're not okay. gonna walk in the room that way, you're probably not gonna have a long meeting either. So that's how you can communicate with me. <laughs> but in some, some folks have actually more patience, but it is a bottom lines up front type approach, yes. And to borrow from Wendy's idea about hand puppets, um, I think Clippy should be running all the meetings. So see what you can do to make that happen. I miss. Well, Clippy. we haven't. You know, the Clippy emoji <laughs> is back. We had a vote on I know. Twitter. I know. And got, we wanted excited. twenty thousand likes. We got over a couple hundred thousand. So the the, uh, the emoji is back at least. We love Clippy. I love Clippy. Uh, so moving on to a different mascot, let's talk about birds and Twitter. <laughs> so Rinky, and I know his name is Larry Bird. I, I discovered that the, the Twitter bird is named Larry after Larry Bird. Uh, but I digress. Rinky, what can you share with us about uh, communication and how you know you like to be pitched to or how people can better communicate with upper levels? Yeah, I, you know, 
when I think about this, I folks like time is just so limited. And I think the quicker um, I, I loved conversations where they're very direct um, and folks come clear with what their ask is up front that here's what I need from this meeting. I think um, Wendy and Anne alluded to that. I also think um, bring, especially when you know, a lot of times there's as a CISO, you hear about problems and issues in the company and that and I want I want people to come not just with a problem, but a proposed solution and what we can do about it. And so I think those are um, really important things. Um, I also get, you know, and I'm, I'm sure everybody here, we get pinged about mentorship or coaching um, and people will just come and say, hey, I want to. I want to have a conversation with you, skip level. I want you to be my mentor, but then there's no details on what they're looking for from a mentor or how they want to be mentored or how they want to be coached or what training that they're looking for. And so I think being direct, coming in with a clear ask, coming in with, here's kind of the problems I'm dealing with. Here's how I think I'm going to go solve them. Do you have advice or whatever it is, uh, whether it's related to a security issue, whether it's a mentoring uh, thing, I think those are uh, really important things um, just because otherwise it's a lot of times you sit in a meeting and 20, 30 minutes later, you're still wondering what that meeting was about. <laughs> so you, you brought up something that that is a really good point and I'm going to pivot off it for a second. So uh, if you have someone who um, is maybe perhaps on, on the spectrum, who maybe, because you said about being direct, um, do you have any tips or does anyone on the panel have any tips for folks in that situation who, um, you know, they want to be direct, but they also don't, they don't want to come off as rude. Like, are there any skills you can put into place that to make sure that you're being direct, but not rude? Do you understand what I'm asking? I'm, I mean, that's honestly, that probably can go for everybody, <laughs> you know, wh whether or not um, if you're um, of your brain type, but I'm just curious since Rinky brought up being direct, um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, so I'm going to take it from somebody who's, who is taking the meeting, not somebody in the meeting. One mm -hmm. of the things I try to do is and and is take people off the defensive as, as much as possible. So I don't sit behind my desk. I go, you know, I sit with them at the conference table next to them, um, and it, those types of things. And I think that when, especially when you have folks who may be on the spectrum, right, who are, you know, super talented folks, but you want them to feel like they can communicate with them, you need to do everything you can to make the environment as comfortable as possible and to be as open as possible and to and to truly that's when you truly have to you know make sure you are listening and you are understanding and you and you also need to make sure your head isn't in the space of everyone needs to show up to you the same way right because you do need to allow people to bring we talk a lot about bringing your authentic or your whole self to help self to work so as a leader you have to respect that but i also just try to create an environment where people aren't intimidated you know i do that in interviews too because i think you get better outcomes and i really try to, to to meet people where they're at because i think you have better dialogues that's great and i thank you to one of our viewers here john uh Logic. Uh, neurodivergence was one of the words I was trying to think of on the fly, mm -hmm. and I could not think of that. So I, yes. I do apologize. That that's what I was trying to get at. So thank you, John. And Charlotte yeah. Black Blackmer also uh, raised a good point that sometimes direct from women is read as rude, and that's uh, probably a talk for another another day. But I just wanted to share her her comment there. Yeah. Uh, if I can make a comment yeah, here, please. as someone who is. Um, uh, I, I'm neurodivergent myself, and, and I have lots of family and loved ones who are neurodivergent. Um, I, I want to make sure that people who, who are and understand that it, it's not necessarily a case that um, people who are neurodivergent can accidentally say something rude and not know that they're being rude. People, they, they can tell when people are upset that, you know, they, they, they can't necessarily backtrack and re reverse engineer why they're upset, but they can tell that something landed badly. They're not sure why. And so it's always helpful uh, if you're neurodivergent yourself to say, you know, th this is important for me to say, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to say it the right way and, you know, go ahead and, and say that up, but just be a little more explicit about, was that a joke that you just made or, um, you know, uh, let me see if I if I understand this, uh, you know, were you serious when you said this? And there is nothing wrong as a as a neurotypical person it, by being that explicit and that verbose and asking, you know, I, I just want to make sure I understand whether this was a joke or not. 
Got it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for explaining that. Yeah, you know, I said I, I apologize. I couldn't think of that correct term, um, but everybody got what I was I was getting next. I felt like we definitely should mention that. And Lena, I didn't forget about you. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So I was going to preface this by saying I I don't know if people realize this but uh, but the Scots have a very direct way of speaking. <laughs> I think that's an understatement maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um one of my favorite Scottish expressions is you'll've had your tea. So it's like if you invite someone over to your house you'll say you'll've had your tea meaning like don't come expecting food or drink like <laughs> at my house. You'll so, have eaten already so don't try and mitch off me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So given your your you know, different considering this panel perspective on on communication. Can you share with us, you know, what what some tips are for communication um, and directness and things like that? Well, it, it's funny you mentioned the Scottish thing because we, I mean, we're kind of we are blunt because it just gets to the point, and then you've got more time to have fun. Uh, so <laughs> some of the some of the feedback I got since I moved to America uh, was. Be aware that the person, especially for skip down, they were, be aware that the person you're talking to could be absolutely terrified of talking with you. They've never met a C-suite in their life. And the conversation will likely be the topic of their discussion with their family and friends for a while to come, even if it's the most bland, boring discussion that you've had for that day. Um, so I, I've found that I have to be very careful with my words. Everything I say is going to be pulled apart and interpreted in a myriad ways. And... You know, I've and I'm sure we've I'm sure we've all done this kind of off the cuff. You know, it'd be nice to see a chart that did blah de blah. You know, seven minutes later, the chart's there because they've dropped everything else, and their boss is phoning me up saying, "Why did you ask him to do this chart?" I'm like, "I didn't. I just said it would be a good idea." So, I mean, that's kind of one thing that I've learned is just to be really careful with my words. And in terms of communicating up, I like to be consent, concise, honest, and present. Um, I'm sure we've all been in meetings where you know that somebody's making stuff up and it's embarrassing and you just want to say just shush like you know <laughs> there's another saying in Scotland it's like dinner fash like don't, just just stop <laughs> so sometimes I just stay, say things in Scottish they're like okay that sounds like I should shut up um <laughs> but yeah just be honest and if you don't if you don't know the answer just say like I'll get back to you in like 24 hours and then you get back to them because uh, we yeah. can tell the heartbeat if you're making stuff up. We've got like the, the BS meters just running at high. So I, I love that. And, and the other thing that we should make sure that everyone remembers is that people whose native language is not English mm -hmm. are going to end up probably coming across as blunter because uh -huh. their vocabulary isn't quite as extensive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I especially with uh, my German buddies, uh, if they're if we're exchanging email in English, it's going to come across as really blunt. But if you talk with them in person and just kind of hang out for a while, you realize that it's you know a speaking style that comes from uh, you know a, dealing with a second language, and we all have to respect the heck out of that. Absolutely, wow. fantastic point. Thank you, Wendy, for mentioning that. And I apologize, Rinky. Did I get to you for this question? We we did, right? Okay, sorry. I'm I I have my little system and I'm, it's already fallen. The wheels are coming off. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to multitask here. Uh, let's move on to question five. Here, question five. Rosalind Carter, the wife of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, said, "A leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be." So let's talk for a few minutes about exerting influence setting good examples, and being role models as CISOs. What techniques do you employ for getting your human assets to be on board with a security program or even their own professional development? Now, whether it's convincing a fellow C-suite member or a frontline end user, panel, what thoughts or examples of persuasion do you utilize to get the message of security across? And I want to go to Lena because I'm hoping there's a headbutt involved. <laughs> yes, also known as a Glasgow kiss. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so I've always found that honesty is best. I mean, it's just, I, I'm not very good at lying. I'd be a terrible poker player and my face goes bright red. Um, 
Also, I found that telling people the possible outcomes if they don't do something can be very powerful, uh, you know, and there has to be a resp personal responsibility and accountability are, are also very important to me. And you have, to, you know, I know it's trite, but you have to lead by example. If you're underhand and you're always trying to stab people in the back and people know that about you, you're not going to last very long. And, you know, to, to Wendy's point, even if you are blunt, people will still listen to you as long as you're honest with it. That's what I find. Or maybe they're just terrified of me. I really don't know. So. <laughs> Got it. Um, Rinky, I want to go to you because as, as you already know, one of my former coworkers told me how much uh, she looks up to you, admires you. The exact quote was, I want to be Rinky Sethi when I grow up. So be since you have that, that fan base, <laughs> how do you feel um, about, you know, being a role model and, and what, ac you know, what actions do you take uh, for leadership? Yeah, I had to take that screenshot and then text it to my daughter to be like, see, someone thinks I'm cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> she does, she definitely doesn't. Um, no, I, you know, leader, I, I feel like leadership is more of an art than a science. And, um, and it's all about people understanding people, every person is different. And um, one of the things I've learned is, and I've learned from many of the women that are on this panel actually is you have to bring your whole self and your authentic self. And that includes sharing with people, your vulnerabilities, sharing with people who you are. Um, and we saw, we saw uh, Wendy just do that a few minutes ago and um, it, it makes people open up to you. And when you have that personal connection, it's hard to influence or set a strategy and get people on board if they don't trust you. And so trust is everything, and especially for a role in security. Um, and I, I, I can tell you that there, I've made the mistake of going into a company, setting a strategy really quickly, feeling the pressure that I've got this 90 day plan and I've got to go and just get it done. And I didn't take the time to build the relationships that I needed to, to understand the folks on the team, understand my peers, understand the leadership, what was important to them, because I was so focused on, I've got to get this 60 in 60 days, I've got to have the strategy done. And by 90 days, I've got to be executing on it. And the execution wasn't going as planned. And it made me realize that now I got to slow down to really be effective and then be able to move fast. And so um, I, I think it's really important to it, that at the end of the day, it's just a human connection influence is all about building the right relationships. Um, you know, I, I also think it's really important to bring data to the and facts to the uh, table when you don't have those relationships built yet so that you can start then bringing things to the table that are not based on opinion, not, you know, based on anything other than the what is the actual truth, which is data. So I think those things have proven, in my opinion, to be very effective ways to gain trust, to build uh, to build kind of a following, and then to be able to execute, to build the right partnerships. Fantastic. And we're happy to all sign a card to your daughter to let her know how much we all <laughs> think of you and how highly we think of you. <laughs> um, Anne, other than enticing people with screen time with your cute puppies, <laughs> how do you, uh, how, how do you exert influence, whether it's to get a buy-in for security or even just helping a mentee with professional development? How, how do you see yourself for question five? Yeah, so people know if you genuinely care, right? People can tell instantly if you genuinely care, if you're being honest. I tend, you know, I, I tend to be very honest, a little bit probably too blunt at times, but I do genuinely care. And I genuinely care about our security program. I genuinely care about um, all of the people. And I, I'm going to take this to a people aspect just for a moment. Because I think that, that part of the quote that's really important is that getting people where they don't necessarily want to go, but they, they ought to be. And when you're thinking about career development with people, um, the, about half the people I've worked with actually have a, a pretty defined plan. I want to do this, this, and this. About a half are like, I'm not sure what I want to do. And having those deep conversations and staying connected with the people and being really thoughtful. And some of the hardest conversations I've had with people is say, look, this isn't role actually isn't a good fit for your skills and your aptitude and your background or even your desires. And Kenley, you're not enjoying it. <laughs> so let's talk about where you should be. What can the company, you're a, you know, you're a talented person, you bring a lot to the table. Where can you and the company find a good match where you're going to be fulfilled and you're going to be having a lot of impact for the company? Those are really hard conversations to have, but you have to be comfortable having them. You have to do them from a place of genuine caring 
for the individual. And you have to, and, and Rinky said it, you have to have established trust, right? They have to trust you and know you'll have that conversation with them and you'll keep them, they're in a safe space and they can talk about what's really on their mind. And to me, that's how you actually get people to where they ought to be. You actually listen, you engage, you invest the time and it's not a one-off conversation. Um, all of us, I think on this panel, do a lot of mentoring. There's a lot of those conversations that are long-term conversations till you finally get people into a great place for them and they're feeling fulfilled. And when people are fulfilled, they're going to do the rest work. Fantastic answer. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so down there in the deep of the heart of Texas, Wendy, how do you light a fire under people? Well, I'm, I'm going to counter with a, a quote from my dad um, <laughs> who used to say, there they go. I must hurry and catch up with them for I am their leader. Um, that's often how I, I feel that, um, you know, sometimes I'm not leading, I'm helping to support from behind. Um, I don't necessarily know where we're going either. And, um, I feel uncomfortable sometimes these days with presuming that I know what's best for somebody. And so, uh, you know, as everybody else has been talking about, it, it's really important to find out what the person themselves wants, because they might say, you know, I'm happy in this position. I don't, I don't need to advance. Um, that that's totally a thing. Um, so it's it's finding out what they really do want. But having said that, some of the best managers that I've had have told me a couple of things. They've explained to me what was going on at their level so that I could understand. And secondly, they would tell me what skills or experience I was missing and they made sure that I could get it. Like they would say, you haven't managed any budgets yet. I'm gonna put you on you know, to, to do this. So they made sure that I learned things, but what I did with it after that was up to me. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky, extremely lucky to work with very senior, very smart people and a lot of times I'll say, I, I don't know what we should do here. What do you think? And uh, so sometimes we all take turns leading and I'm really just there, you know, to, to sing backup for anybody who needs it. Uh, that, that's just kind of my position. Oh, wow. I it would be such an honor to have you as a, as a pip in the background. One of the, the, the exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Let's move on to question six, which is, kind of a, an interesting question, but uh, let's see where this goes. So no, question number six is, renowned coach of the Green Bay Packers football team, Vince Lombardi, famously said, leaders aren't born, they're made. So panel, what made you into a leader? Are there classes, books, experiences, philosophies, uh, any of that shaped and formed how you see leadership and execute it? Uh, so let's let's kind of get in real deep here with Rinky. Uh, what is there anything that uh, that you follow or that guides you that you feel made you into a leader? Um, I, you know, it's interesting because I I have read a lot of leadership books to learn um, and just get inspired. Um, but what's actually taught me the most are other leaders. Um, I've watched really good leaders um, and, or just people that I've heard from afar or seen from afar where I'm like, I wanna be like her when I grow up or people. And then the opposite too, where you work for really bad leaders or you see really bad leadership traits and you're like, I'm never gonna do that. And I need to make sure like what makes someone behave that way because I need to learn what it is so that I never do that. Um, and those are the things that I think have shaped me. Like I try to follow the good fo and that I think, or at least what I feel is good and try not to follow what I think is bad. Um, and I also rely, I constantly ask for feedback. Um, even today, I don't think I'm like, perfect in any way, shape or form. I have a lot more to learn. I will ask feedback from my peers, from my employees, from my leaders on what am I doing well that I should do more of that might, that I might not be aware of. What can I do better? Um, what do I need to improve on? What is something? And I try to form relationships where people feel comfortable telling me that, hey, Rinky, that was off, that you probably don't want to do that again or whatever it is. So um, yeah, that's how I've learned and shaped and you know, continue to learn and shape. Um, I Every now and then I 
look for books or um, videos or things that I can get inspired by to like refresh. And so I think that's really important too. Um, I, I get inspired constantly on Twitter itself, actually, uh, where I've found a whole new InfoSec family. Um, so I think that's been uh, amazing as well. Fantastic. Wendy, do you have any philosophies that you follow other than the sage wisdom of your father <laughs> as uh, far as you know, um, that's... leadership goes? <laughs> and and Our, hand puppets. It's just hand, uh, yeah, hand puppets. <laughs> it, it's, all, it's all hand puppets. Well, I was going to say, yeah, leaders are totally, yeah, leaders are made. In, in fact, my first promotion to a managerial position was a surprise to me because I didn't know about it until they had an all hands meeting and they put it up on the screen <laughs> on an org chart. And I had to turn to my colleagues and go, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Um, and I had no, you know, I had very hands off management. I had no mentorship. I had to figure it out myself from, from that time forward. And yes, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and and had to learn from them. I, I love the idea of learning from other people's examples, both positive and negative. But I think the other thing that has helped me a lot, and some of it is probably just getting older, it's when I've gotten to the point where I feel confident in saying, I don't care if this is the culture or if this is how the top leaders do it, this is wrong, and I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to to settle for it. And I don't know how to, you know, how to encourage other people to get to that point as well, to, to trust yourself and say, you know, this, this culture is just wrong. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go along with it. I'm not going to emulate it, even though this is how it's done. Um, I, I'd love to hear from, from everybody else on the panel, how, how you share that with somebody else. Yeah, Lena, do you want to comment on Wendy's question and the, the question in general? Uh, I think the philosophy that changed me was being told no, I wasn't going to amount to anything. You know, I left school when I was 16. I didn't have a degree. I, you know, I've been working since I was 14. I had to, you know, lots of things happened. And, you know, I used to be told you'll be a typist. You, you just, you know, just type. You'll be fine at that. Um, and I thought, I stuff you. <laughs> And so I, I, this is horrible and I'm not really a spiteful person, but I do sometimes go onto like Facebook and just see the people that said I would come to nothing are still living in the same place and doing the same stuff. And sometimes I'm tempted to go, ha, huh, but I don't. <laughs> I was a typist too. So yay, yay. typists <laughs> represent. I'm telling you, learning how to touch type <laughs> probably really helped in this job because you can type and you can talk and you can do five different things and it just freaks people out. Yep. It, oh yeah, who's whose mic is on that is talking? <laughs> that it's not that's not me. Uh, so let's just try to plow through. I don't know where that sound is coming from. Um, and do you have any comments for this question? Yeah, I think it's a, it's like a, a sum up of everybody, right? You know, when when my I'll I'll take it back to when my daughter was born, people would ask me, "What's your parenting philosophy? What books have you read? What method are you following?" And I said, "Hey, I just don't want to f the kid up too bad, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> if she turns out to be a you know a successful adult and self assured, and it's kind of my leadership philosophy too. I've read a lot of books, I've taken a lot of courses, but much like Ranky, I've learned actually more from I've had some great leaders, I've also had some really awful leaders, and I try to emulate. I have no problem stealing stuff." from great leaders and saying, I'm going to take this into my own thing. And then that being your authentic self, right? And showing people you care and truly not trying to mess up too badly in the org um, because we all have a lot to learn. You know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm at the stage of my career and Wendy, you, you said it and I'll say it a little more bluntly is I don't have a lot of, um, I don't care as much about what people think about me and I don't care. And there's some privilege in not having to always tow the company line. I recognize there's some privilege of that, right? You hear a certain stage of your career and you can be a little bolder and a little braver and go against the grain. Um, but I am at that point in my career where I'm saying I, I, I want to learn constantly. I also ask for solicit and take a lot of feedback because, you know, I make mistakes, right? And I want to learn from them. But I also recognize that there's a certain culture I want in the organizations that, you know, I'm blessed to be part of. And like Wendy, I don't, you know, I roll up my sleeves. I don't care what part of the team I'm on, right? But I also want a certain culture. And if that goes against the grain a little bit, I'm okay with that, right? 
Awesome. Fantastic answers, everyone. So a um, little time check here. We need to start wrapping this up. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to uh, read read something that we discussed on one of our practice sessions. And then I'll just uh, do a quick loop around for some closing comments. So what I'd like to read is, is that the panelists and I would like to close out today's discussion by remembering two of the great information security leaders who are tragically no longer with us, but whose legacy lives on for us to admire and to aspire to being more like them. So first, one of the many ways Becky Bass was an inspirational leader was through being a mentor. One of her former mentees said, I owe my involvement and leadership in the security profession to Becky, as do countless other current leaders in the profession today. Becky Bass considered her mentees like her own children and gladly shared her skills, contacts, and knowledge with them. It's that kind of selflessness and generosity that also very much makes you a leader. Dan Kaminsky showed leadership through his tireless research. It was said that his passion for sharing and learning was infectious and exemplary. Dan Kaminsky showed leadership through his actions and contributions. One of Dan's friends said about him, it was never about ego. It was always about what the best answer to a problem was. Both of these examples of Becky and Dan show different ways you can be a leader and the legacy that you can leave behind. Let us use them and others as an example of how we should conduct ourselves within the information security industry and community. So let's do a quick round robin th uh, final thoughts on anything leadership, CISO related. Uh, let's uh, let's start with Anne. We'll go, just go alphabetical order here. So Anne Johnson, please close us out for this uh, this panel session. Yeah, Tracy. So thank you, and thank you for those memories. And I think we all could aspire, you know, to be like those individuals. Um, I want to thank all the ladies here. This has been fun. The prep for it has been fun. You know, we, we all do a lot of these. The group of women, you're a group of women that I'd love to just go out and have a, a glass of tea with, right? <laughs> Which is like, this has been wonderful. I hope the audience did get something out of it. And um, feel free you know, to reach out to me. I'm on a lot of different social media platforms, but I'm happy, um, I'm happy to help folks. And if there's further questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thanks, Lena and Wendy and Renke. This has been wonderful. And thank you so much, and boops to your pups for it from us all. Uh, Wendy, any any final thoughts for us? Um, yeah, I got nothing, which is pretty <laughs> much my <laughs> philosophy of leadership. I'm pretty sure I have no idea, but luckily I know a lot of people who have great ideas. So you know, I, I would say, when in doubt, search them out you know, when in doubt, go to other people. You, you don't have to do this alone and, uh, you, and you can do more than you think you can. Wonderful. Wonderful. Rinky, any, any final thoughts on this that you'd like to share with us? It's an honor being here, uh, with all, uh, all of you inspiring ladies. I like couldn't be more thrilled. Um, and, um, uh, many women I've been looking, I've looked up to, I, uh, shared with the group before that I was starstruck. I didn't know what to say when I first got together with this group. So um, just it's been it's been an honor. Um, please stay connected with me if you're watching this. I'm on Twitter. Reach out. Um, I love to help um, other women and other people in the security space. Um, so please reach out anytime and at, at any of the avenues. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Fantastic. Thank you. And Lena, bring us home with some wisdom about shortbread and tablet and all things Scottish. <laughs> oh, God, no, I had some tablet the other night and it's just, oh, it's just sugar with some food on it. Um, so now you've made me hungry. Uh, but I've, I've had the best time. I just, I mean, I love talking to you ladies. I could do this all day. And uh, I'm just really honored to be part of this group. And thank you for those really kind words um, about people that have gone too soon from this air. So thank you very much. This was just an honor to be part of this. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, uh, that wraps this up. So thank you so much to the panelists, to the organizers, to the volunteers, uh, to my dogs and husband who have stayed out of the way for the past hour. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this has been wonderful. So thank you all so much. Um, and just have a great, great rest of the conference and just be healthy, be safe, be great, be your authentic self. Bye. Thank you. Bye.